do you know what tardive dyskinesia is and what you can do to prevent or to treat this problem? This is our topic today. My name is Dr. Sayas. I am a triple board certified in neurology, internal medicine, epilepsy, and I'm also fellowship trained in movement disorders and neurology. start defining what is tardive dyskinesia. The word tardive means coming late or tarde in Spanish. And dyskinesia means abnormal movement. It's a not a specific term. And I prefer to use the term tardive syndrome because many times the symptoms are not just abnormal movements. You might have also vocalization, noises such as humming, moaning, even the way that you breathe might change, might be affected. And also you might have a sensation of restlessness, not being able to stay still, to sit down. We call that akitisha. We believe that tardive dyskinesia or syndrome is due to any medication that block on dopamine. It's a side effect of this medication. However, we cannot predict. There is no way I can predict which patient will develop this problem. We know that females, older females are more predisposed to have this problem. And also there is possibly a genetic predisposition to have this problem as well. But again, we don't know why this is happening. We have some ideas regarding the pathophysiology behind this problem, but we are not sure. The next question is how common is this? Well, approximately 25% of the patient taking dopamine blocker agents might develop tardive dyskinesia. Everything depends on the study and how the study was performed. This is the list of medication, medication that block dopamine and could cause tardive dyskinesia. This list here that you see in this corner are first generation of neuroleptic or anti-dopaminergic agents. Uh, this one that you see here are the second generation that is, they are less likely to cause this problem, but still they can cause this problem. All of these medication that you see here are medication that uh, providers use to treat the following conditions, schizophrenia, um, bipolar disorder, depression, severe agitation, and there are other mental health conditions that uh, people use these medications. This is another list of four medications that might cause tardive dyskinesia as well. These four medications that you see here in this corner uh, are used to treat nausea or vomiting. To make things more complex, other medications apparently not related to dopamine blocking agent might unmask this problem or something similar to tardive dyskinesia. In patients who were taking dopamine receptor blockers agents in the past, these other medications include SSRIs such as fluoxetine that you see here, uh, and nobody knows about the mechanism or how this happened or if this actually is, if this is related to a non-dopamine blocker agent. We don't know. Now, how do you make the diagnosis? Let me clarify two points before going there. Number one, there is no test or imaging study to make the diagnosis, okay? Number two, there is no consensus criteria for how long a patient might be off of this type of medication, dopamine uh, receptor blocker agent, and develop the movement disorder that might be related with the medication. This could be months or could be a year after stopping the medication. There's no consensus. After clarifying these two points, let's make the diagnosis based on the SM5 American Psychiatric Association uh, published in 2013. Number one, you need to have at least a few months of taking this type of medication. I'm talking about anti-dopaminergic agent, anything that blocks dopamine. Could be less if in, in older patients. Number two, 
the involuntary abnormal movement or dyskinesia need to be present for at least a few weeks. Okay. Now, the another question that we have is what type of involuntary movement are we talking about? What type of dyskinesia are we talking about? Well, this is the list of the most common one that you see here in this corner. Okay. So the orobocal lingual dyskinesia, which is the classic one, which is the one that you see patient moving the mouth, especially the tongue. The tongue is have to be involved, happen in approximately 72% of the 72% of the patient. And this is the most common one. But also you have tremors, which is a shakiness. Akitisia, which is is defined as uh, not able to sit down. Uh, the patients feel restless. They are scratching the head. They are moving constantly. They cannot sit down. They cannot stay still. They need to move. They, they, they feel this um, sensation inside of the body that they need to move. And when they move, they feel better. And they move in a, in a stereotype, in a um, coordinated repetitive way. They're constantly moving the fingers and they cannot stay still. This, this is what we call akitisia. Okay. Also, you have the dystonia, where dystonia is abnormal posturing. And typically, the dystonia that you see in patients uh, with Tardi syndrome, that, that we are, the dystonia we're talking here, is typically the neck is pulling backward. Okay, we call that retrocolis. It's very typical for this problem. Also, you have, you have the ticks and the jerks, which, which is a myoclonus. This is, this is the less common. Now, 35% of the patient, they have a combination of, of two or more of this Tardi syndrome that we discussed. Now, let's talk about the most important part of this video. How do you treat these patients? Well, the first step is you need to know the, poten the potential side effect of this medication that you are taking before taking the medication. And this applies to any type of medication. You need to know benefit and side effect. And you need to know that one of the side effects is this problem. So, but remember, this is not common, okay? So there are many patients taking this type of medication and nothing happened. They are doing well. The majority of the patients do well without any side effect. Talk to your doctor about this potential problem. Number two, prevention is the best modality. That's the best thing that you can do. So try to avoid this medication if you can. Uh, sometimes you can. You cannot avoid this medication because you need this medication to treat your mental health. So remember, mental health is more important but you need to know the risk and benefits of the medication. For example, um, if you take a metoclopramide, which is very difficult to pronounce, uh, which in other words, Reglan, uh, to treat your gastroparesis, then use it for less than three weeks. If you use it for more than three weeks, the probability of having tardive dyskinesia increase and also try to use the lowest dose possible. Remember, tardive dyskinesia might or might not be permanent. So early recognition is key. It's very important. Uh, if you are able to switch medication or to taper down this medication, then early recognition is important because the probability of recovering from this problem increase significantly if you recognize uh, this problem uh, early. So very important to talk to your doctor to see if there is any possibility of tapering down or maybe switching to another medication like a, a second generation neuroleptic, uh, which are less likely to cause this problem if you can. Sometimes you can't. Now, when you cannot stop these medications, the anti-dopaminergic agent, or the symptoms are moderate to severe, then you need to take this medication that we see here, okay? So the first choice, the first choice are these two, number one and number two. This is the, the, the first choice. These two expensive medication, the first one is uh, Balbenacin or Ingressa. Uh, they are pretty safe. 
uh, the 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 most common side effect of both of them, both of them is uh, feeling sleepy, somnolence. Uh, the doses that you should start with uh, in in Gresa is 40, 40 milligrams daily, and you can I typically go up to sixty per day, and then uh, uh, after a week I, I go to eighty if needed. Some patients respond even to, to to forty, and some some of them require the full dose of eighty. Austido is the other one, and then uh, recently they approved the long-acting formulation, which is a once and daily. Before Austido, you had to take it twice or three times a day, uh, typically twice. But now with the long-acting, it's a once a day, and I start almost always uh, with six milligrams daily, and I increase every week by six. And this is the typical dose, uh, 12 to 48 milligrams per day. Um, also be aware that if these two medications might interact with other medications. For example, if you are taking a uh, parosetine or fluosetine or bupropion, these three medications that you see here, um, you might need to decrease the doses or, or not taking more than 40 milligrams daily. Okay. Now the other medication that we have, uh, very old medication. But in years ago, this is the only thing that we we had besides these these ones, is tetravenacin. So tetravenacin had the same mechanism of action that these two, uh, but this is the oldest one, and this is not as clear like these two. Uh, so you have more side effects. Uh, again, you have somnolence, but in this one, you the probability of having Parkinsonism increase significantly with this one. Depression is a big deal as well. And many of our patients are already depressed. So technically, uh, you can cause depression in any of these three medications, but more common, significantly more common uh, with tetravenacin. Anxiety, the same thing with anxiety, dizziness and hypotension with tetra tetravenacin. Other medication that we use with level B of evidence, B means so-so, um, is clonazepam. Um, this is the dosis, uh, typically the very low dose uh, that we start, 0 0.25 milligrams daily, and increase progressively. And sometimes you need to divide divide the doses in three to four uh, times per day. The most common side effect is sedation, confusion, falling down, incoordination, and dizziness. So amantadine is another one that sometimes we use. Uh, you start with 100 milligrams in the morning because you take it too late, it might cause insomnia in some patients. This is the most common side effect I see in the clinic. The other one is uh, almost always, I would say, I, I don't want to say always, always, but very frequently when, when I go over 300 milligrams daily, even in a patient with normal renal function, Patient end up having this uh, uh, net like skin discoloration. Um, that it's not a big deal, but it just uh, doesn't look good. It's just a cosmetic issue. So typically, if the patient is not, if there is no ulceration in the skin caused by this, and the patient is not being bothered by the the skin discoloration, so I keep it like that and just monitor that, and that's it. The other side effect is leg swelling uh, with amantadine, especially at the level of the ankles. Now, the other one, <clears throat> based on a Chinese study many years ago, is Jingo biloba. Jingo biloba. I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but Jingo biloba. So the, the doses that they used in the study were 240 milligrams per day divided in three doses. The, the main thing here is if you are susceptible to have bleeding, this is not a uh, supplementation or medication to use, okay? It might cause also headaches and constipation. Now, when any of these medications are helping you, and obviously your function is being really, really affected, nothing is helping you, then one option that you have is to get deep brain stimulation, deep brain stimulation. The problem here is number one is invasive. Um, many insurance uh, is gonna, it's gonna be, 
it's going to be hard to to get the medical insurance to cover this um, because it's not approved by FDA for this, even though that many centers do it. Um, and we have data. We have data that patients actually uh, get better. So it's an option uh, in very severe cases when medications are not helping you. Also, you have the, the risk of infection like any other surgery. Now, just to finish, if you have tardive cervical dystonia, which is the most common type of, of dystonia in these type of patients, which usually is retrocolis, so the neck is like sensation of pulling backward like this, and, and blepharospasm, which is uh, blinking too much like this, Okay, so those patients actually uh, might benefit from um, botulinum toxin injections, uh, such as uh, Botox, Xeomine, and Dyspor. Might be very, very effective and very, very safe. Sometimes I use also for um, oral mandibular dystonia. So those patients that they're having significant mouth movement and jaw movement, and even the tongue, um, I inject on Botox, uh, even for the Tongue, especially when they are protruding the, the thong, I put the needle here and inject the Botox all the way up to the thong. So now the data for vitamin E, vitamin C, I'm sorry, vitamin E, vitamin B6, and propanol are very mixed and or negative uh, results. So I cannot recommend them. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and... Thank you so much.